on Access Tech Live. Samsung unveils some new flagship hardware, the legalities of AI, and we can't stop talking about CES. This is Access Tech Live with Stephen Scott and Mark Aflalo. The latest in tech and accessibility every week. Follow us now and get involved at Access Tech Live. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Access Tech Live. I am Stephen Scott. By my side every week is Mark Aflalo. Mark, another big week in tech news and it's only a couple of weeks into 2024. It seems so quiet on Monday and then we remembered, oh wait, Samsung has something big to announce on Wednesday and it all went, to, you know, you know where it went after that. Yeah, always does. But, you know, we've got a lot to talk about and a lot to break down with the Samsung news. We'll get into that in the headlines in a moment. Uh, but, of course, lots of other conversations to have. You mentioned AI off the top. When do we start doing one of these shows, Mark, where we don't talk about AI? When will that actually ever happen? Will it ever happen? It'll happen when AI does our jobs for us. <laughs> oh, when, when it's doing the show for us. Okay. Exactly. That's it's when AI is even an AI Mark show up for work. Yeah, okay, that's only massively <laughs> terrifying. Thank you for that. Uh, I no am now absolutely scared. Uh, okay, look, let's talk about what else is on the show today. Uh, funnily enough, we're going to be talking about AI and the legalities of AI, as you were saying off top. David Lepowski is joining us today. He's a disability rights attorney, and he'll be joining us to talk all about that, and in particular, a story we're going to be hearing uh, in the headlines in a moment. Uh, and talking about that legal side of AI, because, of course, we're all using it, uh, but what is it that we're getting from it? You know, if you ask it to write your story on a topic like, hey, tell me all about Access Tech Live, where is that information coming from? So it's an interesting discussion we're going to have with David today. Also, we're going to have more from CES. It is the gift that keeps on giving. It really is. And we're mm -hmm. looking forward to sharing even more uh, of the content that we have that we recorded after the camera stopped rolling on our two special episodes that we broadcast last week. What? You haven't checked those out yet? Well, they're all available for you on AMI Plus and on YouTube, so go check them out. But before we get into all of that, here's Mark with the headlines. Now, Access Tech Live headlines. So, yesterday, Samsung took the wraps off their latest flagship smartphones at an event in San Jose. The new devices all feature something called Galaxy AI. They all look identical to last year's models, so nothing to change there, very slight variations. They include the S24, S24 Plus, and the S24 Ultra. Here's Drew Blackard, VP of Product Management for Samsung. The Galaxy S24 series is our most exciting, most innovative, and most intelligent one yet. It'll help you capture and create, take better notes, and enjoy better gameplay. With a range of gender-neutral colors inspired by nature, our Galaxy S24 series redefines durability and style. This series is a testament to resilience, sophistication, and Samsung's cutting-edge innovation. And it contributes to our vision of a sustainable future. The S24 and S24 Plus have new colors, black, gray, violet, and yellow. They're squared off like an iPhone on the corners. The bezels are slightly thinner, and the screen sizes are 6.2 inches for the S24 and 6.7 inches for the Plus. Both also have slightly larger batteries. Now, the S24 Ultra has major changes, or minor changes as well, depending how you look at it. It's a little thinner, has titanium sides. The display is completely flat compared to the rounded edges of older models, and it's available in black, titanium, violet, and yellow. All colors for all the devices are a matte finish as well. Now, software-wise, AI is the star of the show. Surprise, surprise. New features include an AI keyboard that'll make suggestions about your style and tone as you type. Notes will turn random scribbles into bullets and Summaries and voice memos or voice notes get major enhancements thanks to AI as well. Here's Hee Jin Chung, Samsung software R&D lead. I'm sure all of you have had that experience when you're in a group meeting or a lecture and you wish someone could take notes for you. Having a tool that helps you recall who said what and provides a quick recap of lectures and conversations can be helpful to everyone, including those who are hard of hearing. The native voice recorder app on our Galaxy devices has had speech-to-text available in different languages. Now, instead of creating a basic transcript, Galaxy AI can distinguish between different speaking voices and will even create a short and sweet summary of what was said. 
Thanks to Galaxy AI, the Photos app is a full-fledged editor. You can remove things to the background and adjust the background blur, and even select and move objects in a photo while it fills in the rest. Last but not least, one of the apps getting a brand new standout feature is the phone itself. Using AI to offer real-time translation in both text and speech, here's Samsung's VP of Product Management, Drew Blackard again. One of the most important and essential things we do every day is communicate with each other. It's how we express ideas and build relationships. But if we don't share the same language as someone, we can miss opportunities for connection. Like while traveling, language can be a barrier. For example, have you ever used a rideshare app while traveling abroad? You get a call from the driver, but you can't communicate because you don't speak their language. Simple situations can become complicated. We're thrilled to offer a solution by providing real-time voice translations while you're on a call. When you make or receive a call in a language you don't speak, the Galaxy S24 series can provide live translations of your call, both verbally and on screen, right away. How cool is that? Google made the appearance of Samsung's event as well, announcing a new feature that will be available not only to Samsung devices, but other Android devices. They call it Circle to Search. Here's Google's VP of Search, Kathy Edwards. I'm thrilled to unveil Circle to Search, a new way to search anything on your Android phone using a simple gesture without switching apps. Thanks to breakthroughs in Google AI, you can now circle, highlight, scribble, or tap whatever you're curious about on your screen to learn more. Edwards goes on to give a real world example of how the feature works across Android. She demonstrates it on a picture of an influencer wearing a fancy, fancy sunglasses and a padded bag. Today, if I see something I'm interested in, I'd have to take a screenshot and then leave the app to search it. And switching between different apps can be kind of inconvenient and take you out of your flow. But now, just long press the home button to invoke Circle to Search. And from there, you can select any item, like these sunglasses, to quickly uncover similar options and where to buy them. Without leaving where you are, you could also scribble the bag to see what that is. I've been really into this padded bag trend lately, so we'll definitely be checking these out. It's so amazing, right? I think that padded bag might look good on Steven. Uh, so no matter where you are in the Android operating system, you press and hold the home button and can immediately circle, tap, or scribble anywhere on the screen. It sends it to Google for instant search results. We'll definitely have more as we get hands-on with these devices. In other news, it's not Samsung. Well, OpenAI, the New York Times is in trouble. New York Times is the latest news publication to file a lawsuit against OpenAI and Microsoft and its artificial intelligence software, ChatGPT. According to the Times, the suit alleged that OpenAI used millions of Times articles to train the automated chatbots with information. Now, there's a similar suit to that of other news publications that are siding with the Times. We'll chat with this a little bit deeper with David Lepofsky a bit later on on the show. Meanwhile, ChatGPT is being credited with helping a user, Aaron Ramirez, succeed as a blind computer science student. Aaron revealed the challenges he faced before discovering ChatGPT and how the AI service played a pretty pivotal role in transforming his learning experience. He was quoted as saying, I was practically failing before ChatGPT because of a few of my professors were visual learners or teachers. We'll hear from Ramirez a bit later on in the show. Finally, the Blind Shell Classic 2 is getting a pretty cool update. The Blind Shell is a leading provider of smartphone technology for those who are blind or partial cited and they've announced that their blind shell classic 2 is the latest device to get the be my ai feature from be my eyes the process is simple according to double taps michael babcock making it accessible for people with varying levels of technological proficiency i think that's enough news for the day steven i think that just might be like my limit a lot of news to take in and a lot of samsung yeah. news and interesting you know we even heard there about you know, how technology is helping people who are hard of hearing. I think what's interesting, and I think what is fascinating is we're starting to see, 
a normalization of accessibility in a really cool way. We're just talking about it now. It's no longer this walled off thing that you know lives behind this thing called accessibility in your smartphone mm -hmm. or in your computer. It's just part of everyday life. And I think people are starting to realize that. And this is great because of course, that makes more products more accessible because you know you might call that feature accessibility adjacent, right? It's not really an accessibility feature, but it becomes one. And I think that's fantastic. So yeah, I mean, look, and look, forget all that. Are you going to buy a Samsung S24? I, I kind of want one now because of these features. I'll tell you, software is now what is kind of defining what's better and what's not. So, you know, to the other ones out there, you know who you are. You got to up your game a little bit on the software side to make it compelling because these are really interesting features. Yeah. Samsung, well, the S stands for sexy. That's it. <laughs> Stephen, the question of the day today is, how are you using AI in your daily life? A cool question because this can go in so many different directions. If you want to get involved and let us know your answer, you can connect with us on all social media platforms at Access Tech Live. Maybe you're watching it right now in one of those. Or you can email us feedback at Access Tech Live as well and get involved. When we return here, David Leposky joins us to break down the news of the week and dive into some of the legalities. I got a lot of questions here about AI in general. Please do stick around. We'll be right back. There's more Access Tech Live to come. Get involved and have your say at Access Tech Live on social media. We'll be right back. Access Tech Live will return in less than two minutes. Access Tech Live is in a commercial break. Access Tech Live will return in less than two minutes. Access Tech Live is in a commercial break. The show will return in less than a minute. Tech Live will be back in 30 seconds. Tech Live, the latest in tech and accessibility with Stephen Scott and Mark Aflalo. Welcome back to Access Tech Live. Now joining us now is a familiar face to viewers of AMI and listeners to AMI Audio as well. Uh, he joins uh, now with Dave Brown regularly, as well as the team over at uh, Kelly and Ramia as well. Uh, David Lepofsky is the chair of the Accessibility for Ontarians Dis with Disabilities Act Alliance, and he's also the visiting research professor of disability rights at the Faculty of Law for the University of Western Ontario. David, I hope I got all that right. Good to have you here with us <laughs> on Access Tech Live. It's great to uh, virtually meet you. It is great to virtually meet you too. Uh, you know, I'm just going to guess you're a, a tech head like us, aren't you a huge fan of technology? I can't avoid buying it as soon as I hear about it, which is why listening to you guys is a very dangerous thing for my bank account. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, now, look, I want to talk to you about AI, of course, because AI is in the news all the time. And we heard earlier about that story uh, of OpenAI in the New York Times. Where do, we, where do businesses stand with this? And how do 
how does AI itself stand? Companies like OpenAI, for example, at legally when it comes to the way that they essentially train their language models, how does it, how does that stand legally, as far as you know? Well, you know, uh, as a fan of Star Trek, we know the opening word space, the final frontier. Well, when it comes to law, I would say AI is the final frontier. We are boldly going where no law has gone before. Uh, the thing is that when we deal with law problems, we lawyers think in terms of precedent, which in other words means we try to think about how we solve the problem before, which is almost the stupidest way to, to try to solve a problem that's never existed before. So trying to take 19th or 20th century legal concepts and graft them onto a purely 21st century thing is a real challenge. You take copyright principles or patent principles that were evolved, oh, I think at the time of the printing press, uh, and, and apply it to AI, and we're running into difficulties. So when I look at, at just delve into this, and it's not a specialty of mine, I'm, I'm, in, I'm 66, I retired from practice as a criminal and constitutional law. If I was starting today in law school, I'd want to specialize in AI in the law because it's a whole new area. So when you hear about these lawsuits, Stephen, like, like whether uh, a company, uh, an AI uh, company is making improper use without compensation of the New York Times or other news things, they, they got an argument at one level. You know, you usually pay for the paper. Uh, and here on a mass level, uh, a company is essentially getting the benefit of buying the paper without paying for it, much less paying for all of the earlier editions that they're, they're getting the benefits from. So at one level, you can understand why the New York Times is concerned. But David, wouldn't the New York Times want their information to be, you know, it doesn't validate what they're doing. I mean, they put out the information for people to consume. And normally when it comes to copyright, it's about using it and, and gaining financially, right? Right now, there's no real set and model in any way, shape, or form on how these companies are even making making money on it. So does it kind of compare with copyright law, or is it just, well, are we just in a whole here's new Here's where the problem is. When, when, when we have a legal challenge like this, there, there are two ways of trying to figure out how to solve it, one of which is to look back at old legal principles and see at common law if we can graft them onto a new problem and find a solution. Uh, we have freedom of expression principles that debated were uh, created at a time when the way you communicated was by uh, maybe printing a pamphlet and handing it out in the in the town square. And now you try to apply that to Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Um, the other way of doing it is saying, look, we don't even pretend that those old principles are capable of being transformed. Uh, or it's going to be pretty arbitrary. So why don't we come up with new legislation? And I would see that there's going to be a lot of pressure on governments to try to figure out, and legislatures and parliaments to figure out, can we come up with a new way to balance all of this? But newspapers uh, uh, came up with the idea of charging you for a copy of a paper or a, an online subscription when it's one human being consuming either one paper or subscribing to read online uh, and maybe letting you share the password with a couple of people. When AI does this, it's the it's the equivalent of you know thousands and thousands of people doing it, um, and maybe with only one subscription or none. And newspapers can't make but, but money that way. But there's a difference way. here, though, David, isn't there? There's a difference here yeah. because the, the difference being is that people can then take that information and they can regurgitate it and represent it to someone as their own work, and that is ultimately the problem here. It's not necessarily that their information is being used. In, I mean, I know that the argument and their lawsuit is all about the use of this, but that's what it's about. It's about essentially but they can, they can do that now today. Model. Guys, they can do that now yeah. today just by reading the newspaper. People can, you know, this is what people do in school. They research, they look at a newspaper, they research the article, or they cite, the, and as long as they cite the source, they're okay. They use that for educational purposes. Ah, I well, think that's the problem, when, though. They don't, they yeah. don't cite the sources. That's the problem, right? So they're presenting something that is essentially an opinion. Like if, if you asked a student today, you know, to to go off and, and come up with a study on something, they might come back with it and say, okay, here's here's my findings on this. But what they are presenting is their findings. It's not their findings, it's someone else's findings. Well, you know, what the conversation you're having is what makes this such a great topic. I mean, if I was doing a law school seminar 
and asking students to debate, like, what should be the legal principle? What kind of, uh, how would we apply copyright principles that exist? Or how should we draft new legislation? The debate you're having, that we're all having, is the starting point of the conversation we need to have. That's, you know, when we came along to advocate for accessibility legislation, we didn't, we started out with the fact that there was no common law right to equality at all. Well, the, the most that we could do is turn to new legislative requirements that any number of us fought for 40 years ago, equality in our human rights, anti-discrimination laws, equality in our constitutional charter of rights. But we didn't have any common law principles to start from at all that guaranteed us a right to accessibility. We had to start building on legislation and then saying, maybe we need new legislation to make it happen. It's the it, it's the same kind of thing. And that's just one, the copyright thing is just one legal thing. Let me give you a wonderful science fiction fun example. Uh, for those who've watched the movie 2001, spoiler alert, I'm going to give something away, but hell, the computer <laughs> on the spaceship, which is a form of AI, uh, kills deliberately one of the astronauts because he's afraid that he's uh, Frank Poole because he's afraid he's going to unplug him. And uh, so who you can't prosecute Hal for, for murder, uh, but it's a murder. Can you prosecute the manufacturers of the, the AI for murder or maybe criminal negligence causing death for designing software that could kill someone without the proper safeguards? Like how do you apply legal principles of criminal law to conduct caused by AI. Just and, one and, and other. Enough, uh, well, I was going to say, David, that's one other these. thing, of course, with driverless cars is the same argument, right? There's that ethical side of this. How do you, uh, what, <laughs> who do you complain to if the driverless car hits someone on the road? Because you've got a situation where the car is doing something as pre-programmed. So can you blame the car? Do you blame the company? Do you blame the person for getting in the way of it? You know, what do you do here, right? So there's, this is this is kind of leads into that ethical uh, side of the, the debate as well, which is very interesting. See, that, that's it's not just an ethical one. It's a legal one. It's a tort civil law one. Who can you sue and what can you sue them for? Um, it could be a contractual one. Uh, if it's the, the the driver whose car goes out of control and they get injured and they want to go after, you know, the, the Tesla or whoever. Um, and uh, it's a potential criminal one. Um, so it, criminal liability for uh, the company that put the, put the product on the market. And, and so it, it, the, the, there is a long list of which the New York Times lawsuit, copyright lawsuit is just one. How about defamation? What happens if yeah. some AI produces mm. something about you or your program that's defamatory? Who do you sue for libel? Well, you, you know what, that, that came up. You in, can't do that. That came up in recent elections and, and, you know, going into elections, for example, in the U.S., you know, what's stopping someone from deep faking our voices and the day before an election saying something atrocious about one of the candidates that actually affects the election? You know, those are Don't things that we have ideas. to concern about. No, yeah, no, well, no, these absolutely. are ideas that are already out there. I promise you, this has been going on for quite a time. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that that all this stuff is happening. It's like you know, chicken before the egg. So AI come here, everybody sees how great it is, and now the governments are trying to figure out how do we regulate this, how do we control this, how do we protect people, how do they state the sources. I don't think there's a definitive answer for this. I don't think anybody has the answer. I honestly, don't, I'm not even sure if our government and lawmakers are uh, even have enough information to make any kind of definitive answer here, David. What do you think? Well, there isn't an answer. There's going to have to be a multi-pronged answer, and it'll probably be some common law of using or some complex mixture of new legislation and trying to apply old common law uh, principles or apply existing laws like copyright. But let me give you one where this converges with accessibility. We know that AI can be a source for accessibility, like seeing AI and um, those other uh, apps that we love. Uh, but how about those uh, AI-driven uh, products that some employers use to screen resumes to decide who to interview for a job? Mm. Well, this is where you could automate. There's a book called Automating Inequality, and, and this could be a place where we automate inequality because the criteria they may use for how to screen resumes may not involve the kind of flexibility that will take into account the fact that some people with disabilities may have 
weaker resumes because they face so many barriers getting jobs. Beca and, and therefore, they will, uh, they will uh, perpetuate discriminatory employment practices. Uh, and, and you'll never get an interview so that you can prove, you strut your stuff and prove that you're worth uh, being hired because the AI screened you out using those. So there's, there's a potential for AI uh, deployed in that job uh, resume vetting uh, technology for actually being a source of systemic discrimination against people with disabilities. Yeah, that's super. That's an interesting take. Uh, you know, we've got a really cool story coming up after a quick break here, David, um, where a student has actually turned to AI to help him. And and there's, you know, it, it was a situation where he could have said, okay, I'm done, I'm going to quit, or I might find a solution. So we're going to take a quick break, stick around. When we come back, we're going to hear that story from the student himself, Aaron Ramirez. And David, you're going to be joining us again so we can pick that apart. It is Access Tech Live. We'll be right back. There's more Access Tech Live to come. Get involved and have your say at Access Tech Live on social media. We'll be right back. Access Tech Live will return in less than two minutes. Access Tech Live is in a commercial break. Access Tech Live will return in less than two minutes. Access Tech Live is in a commercial break. The show will return in less than a minute. Access Tech Live will be back in 30 seconds. Tech Live, the latest in tech and accessibility with Stephen Scott and Mark Aflalo. Hey everyone, welcome back to Access Tech Live. I'm Stephen Scott. Mark Aflalo is with me today. Now, earlier we mentioned a story of a student called Aaron Ramirez. Uh, he turned to Chat GPT to help him through his computer science education. Now, we were so intrigued by this story that we thought we have to find out more. So we caught up with them this week. I'm a student at Northern Arizona University, um, and I specifically study computer science. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the classes I have to take are taught by very visual professors. And for whatever reason, our computer science department isn't the most accommodating um, so it's, it's led to a lot of accessibility barriers for me, some of which are, are my disability resources office is able to handle, but a lot of it is just, there's too much going on that the disability resource office doesn't have the resources to really follow up on. Like they don't understand the material I'm learning, for example. Um, and so it got to the point where I was repeatedly dropping my classes and re-enrolling in my classes every single semester in the hopes that, hey, maybe this time it'll work out. Um, and it didn't really work out. I, I was considering dropping out, but I couldn't because I had too much debt. So it wasn't really an option. And then ChatGPT happened to come out last 
late November and I picked it up and I started playing around with it. And I immediately realized that, whoa, this is an amazing learning tool. Like a lot of the stuff I've been trying to learn in my classes, it was able to explain to me in about 30 seconds. Um, it, was it accurate? Maybe not, but it gave me the frame of reference I needed to then use the internet to find other resources that might be more accurate. You know, it, it gave me the keywords I needed to learn the rest of what I needed to learn. It just continued from there. You know, once GPT-4 came out in March, it was even more helpful and I had to fact check it significantly less often. And it was just like a, a really awesome tutor and it wasn't, it didn't judge me, you know, it didn't make me feel uncomfortable. I truly don't believe another human could have helped me get out of this little rut because I was constantly thinking like, are they judging me? Do they not think I can do this? Um, even, even if they were blind people, because there's plenty of blind software developers out there. The fact that it was a computer, it was an AI, it wasn't a real person that kind of broke my little mental barriers and it was able to teach me a lot of stuff. And I've, you know, I've been doing great since then. I haven't looked back. That is Aaron Ramirez. I mean, I asked him afterwards in that conversation. I said, uh, because he said something really cool, you know, uh, Stephen was, which was, um, you know, it didn't judge him, right? It didn't worry, you know, it wasn't like his friends. I asked him if his yeah. peers knew that they that he uses it. And they said, yeah, everybody knows that he's using it. He doesn't hide it at all. Let's bring David Leposky back on the chair of the AOD Alliance. David, you know, if, if chat GPT and services like AI like this were available when you were uh, coming up in your education, do you think it would have helped you or you think it would have been the opposite? Well, you know what? Uh, on the one hand, it, uh, there's no question this kind of stuff can always help. We can always find ways that uh, it might assist. And of course, I went to law school and we had to read things uh, called books. And I had to get uh, all my books recorded on audio tape. And I typed my exams on this thing that people may have heard of called a typewriter. On my first law exam, my very first law exam, in my first course in uh, uh, in my first year of law school, the, the ribbon broke partway through the exam. I was writing blank paper uh, for answers. So yeah, there could have been uh, lots of different things. But on the other hand, uh, what infuriates me about what he was just saying are, are, are two things. Um, I mean, I'm delighted the technology helped, but there were two things that infuriated me. The first is that he had to find his own supports. In the United States, yeah. under the Americans with Disabilities Act, that should not be required. Um, and the second thing that absolutely infuriates me as much or even more is of all subjects for him to encounter this in, for him to face it in computer science. Computer science is, the, the, is uh, such a new and growing area. We need people... Uh, who are trained in computer science to be required as part of their courses to include or to uh, to learn accessible human computer interface. It's not a required subject. The same way that you could graduate as an architect here in Ontario without ever learning how to design an accessible building, you could graduate with a computer science degree learning how to write software and apps and so on without knowing how to de design um, a, an accessible uh, human computer interface, app, firmware, software, hardware. It's it's outrageous and it's inexcusable. Um, yeah. It, it, he did tell it, me though it, when that 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 he did have pretty good support when it came to you know in class in terms of the Americans with Disability Act, but unfortunately they weren't up to speed as much as he was with some of the tools that were out there, which is what led him down that road. I did ask him that question. Right, but the you profs know, the other side teaching the profs teaching the course they should be on their agenda yeah. because they should be as part of what they teach. They should be yeah. uh, teaching people. Uh, it, it should be part of their DNA that computer science has to include accessibility in the products they produce. But there's something else in all of this, David, and in, in, in what he says and Aaron's story, which I think resonates with a lot of us blind people out here and disabled people more generally, I would say, is that we do often find our own ways. We, we have to. We have to find our own ways. We sometimes have to look at technology and see how it can benefit us. Where some people might look at something new and say, hey, that's really gimmicky that I can, you know, change my text message to be more emotional or more happy or more sad or, you know, change tone. That can really make a difference for certain people with certain difficulties, certain disabilities, right? Absolutely. Well, uh, uh, settled principles that two people with an identical disability 
may use completely different approaches to address the same accessibility barrier. Some blind people use Braille, some don't know any Braille. Uh, uh, both can succeed and succeed really effectively. Some will use DOS, some, or pardon me, some will use iOS. God, I'm dating myself. Some will use <laughs> iOS, some will use Android, you know, and they'll still make phone calls and do texting and all that other stuff. So um, uh, uh, the fact that he has shown uh, incredible ingenuity uh, to get around these things, I mean, that's, that's, that's uh, unfortunately part of success uh, uh, living with a disability too often in yeah. our society, even though the barriers, uh, the tools for us to overcome barriers in 2024 are radically better than the ones that were available for us, say, 40, 50 years ago, or even 30 years ago. So I want to ask you one question, David, which I know a lot of people ask this question, you know, are you positive or are you negative about AI? But I want to ask you from a disability perspective, because ultimately, well, that's what we're about here, Access Tech Live, but it's also, I think, important to understand uh, that perspective. So, so what is your take on this, from AI from a, a disability perspective? Well, as with so much, it has enormous potential, potential to uh, improve our lives, as we're already seeing from some apps like uh, seeing AI, seeing AI and, and, and the others. Heck, I'm using a um, uh, an off-the-shelf um, USB camera that's got AI built in, so I could you do a hand gesture, it zooms in on me and tracks me. I'm totally blind, and I won't know if it's if I've moved off camera. Uh, that's yeah. AI. So there's lots of those examples, but it's also a serious threat, uh, as the example I gave before the break of AI that screens resumes uh, that 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 uh, perpetuates patterns of, of inequality and unequal opportunity uh, in the workplace. What does that mean? As with everything else we face as people with disabilities, um, we've got to make sure through advocacy, proactively, uh, to get inclusion, accessibility, and equal rights for people with disabilities uh, embedded in our law and practically enforced. And that's something I spend a lot of volunteer time on and lots of other people do. And you you folks do a fantastic job of focusing on in your on this and your other programs. Well, we try, David. And unfortunately, just like all our other shows, time goes by so quickly that we have to say goodbye this uh, this week. But uh, if people want to follow you, where should they where should they go? Uh, either uh, at David Lepofsky, L-E-P-O-F-S-K-Y on on uh, Twitter, I don't use that name, uh, that new name, or go to our <laughs> website, aodaalliance.org. There's a sign up link and just paste in your email, you'll get our updates. David, it has been wonderful to talk to you on the show. I know you're going to come back on uh, with me and Sean over on Double Tap soon so we can geek out a bit more and talk about all of this and have more time with you, which I'm so pleased about. But for now, David Lepofsky, thank you so much for being with us here on Access Tech Live today. Thanks for including me. Coming up, we caught up with two amazing people after the live cameras stop rolling at CES. When we return, we'll introduce you to Teach Access and how companies like Verizon Wireless benefit from everything they do. This is Access Tech Live. There's more Access Tech Live to come. Get involved and have your say at Access Tech Live on social media. We'll be right back. Access Tech Live will return in less than two minutes. Access Tech Live is in a commercial break. Access Tech Live will return in less than two minutes. Access Tech Live is in a commercial break. The show will return in less than a minute.
Access Tech Live will be back in 30 seconds. Mark Aflalo and Mark, let's not forget our question of the week, which our people are contributing to as we speak. And if you're watching along at home right now, you can still get involved with it. You can. It's at Access Tech Live on all our social media. Of course, the email is feedback at accesstechlive.com. The question this week is, how do you use AI? And Kevin Shaw is watching right now live. And he didn't answer that question, but he did uh, did mention something uh, in relation to that interview with David. He goes, there's no reason in 2024 why anyone should go to a university if they want to study coding. There's so many courses online that teach you to code and ones that are way more accessible. So if you, you want to get involved in the conversation, we invite you to do it, no matter what we're talking about, that forum is there for you and uh, as you see we sometimes talk about it on the air too Stephen yeah absolutely get your name uh, on the show and you know that's it we're here live every Thursday 12 noon Eastern on uh, AMI TV and on YouTube so make sure that you uh, do engage with us because uh, yeah you'll get your name read out and uh, Mark will send you uh, one of his many tech toys. I'm sure that's absolutely going to happen. Um, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, I'll be right on that. I committed that to you. Uh, so uh, let's talk about... I'm going to get in trouble now. Uh, CES is, of course, uh, over for 2024, but that does not mean the conversation stops. And uh, here on Access Tech Live, we're going to be continuing that conversation over the weeks and months ahead because ultimately that's what CES is. It's the, it's the starter conversation for uh, tech in 20, or any year, frankly, but in 2024, mm -hmm. this year for sure. Um, and Mark, we're going to continue that uh, conversation now. Yeah, uh, you know, it's the gift that keeps on giving. And we had a chance to catch up with Kate Sonka. She's the executive director of Teach Access, a nonprofit organization that works to close the gap on the understanding of the principles of accessible design and development kind of to ensure technologies are, are kind of born accessible. Now, she sat on a panel at CES called The Future of Inclusive Design. And alongside her is a friend of hers and the head of accessibility for Verizon Wireless, Fred Moltz. Now, hot off their panel, they came straight to us to have a conversation and discuss the importance of accessibility education at all levels. Here are uh, both of them together in that conversation. Tell us about Teach Access, what your mission is and what you do with Teach Access. Yeah, happy to. So we are a nonprofit organization. Um, we're based in the United States, um, although we have partnerships and collaborations extending outside of the US. Um, but our core mission is to support um, higher ed faculty and instructors to teach about accessibility and disability um, to current students with the intention that as they graduate and they go to work for Verizon or any of the companies that are here or beyond, um, they know to include accessibility from the beginning of a design um, phase, process, ideation, include it along the way. Um, one of the sort of common things that we like to say is that we are about um, breadth more than depth. And so what I mean by that is we're really looking for large scale introduction of these topics um, for students uh, so that, that there's a lot of people who know a little bit about accessibility out there. Um, we'll always need experts like Fred, like you all. Um, but if everybody knew a little bit, imagine how that would you know, really move the needle on creating products that are accessible from the beginning. Now, Fred, I think uh, if you're, unless you're under a rock, I don't think you would not know what Verizon is as a company. However, I think the association um, from at least our audience or where our audience watches the show would be Verizon is a wireless carrier, but there's so much more to Verizon. And I'm curious to know how your role as a chief accessibility uh, officer and someone who's been at Verizon for quite some time, not that that's a bad thing, um, Tell us about Verizon when it comes to accessibility and what you do there. So Verizon, it's a great company. And the fact that we have invested in accessibility and we continue to invest in accessibility is what really excites me. It's what really keeps me motivated, keeps my team motivated each and every day. Um, we are looking at everything from an accessibility perspective, whether that is customer-focused tools, platforms, product services, 
or it's for our own internal employees because that's just as equally important. We want to bring in the right talent, retain the right talent, and make sure they can do all the great things that they're supposed to be doing. So at the end of the day, accessibility really is interwoven through our DNA and throughout all that we're doing at Verizon. So it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of work to still be done. You know, we are continually every year to move that needle and really help to make a difference. Yeah, and this panel that you're both on is the future of inclusive design. And this matters to, like you say, Fred, to everyone, right? It's about the customers, but it's about staff as well. You know, you want to make sure that your workforce is as diverse as it can be, and that must include disabled people. Yeah, you know, and, and honestly, and that's what it all comes down to, right? We want to make sure everybody is aware. And I think part of you know, with uh, Kate and uh, Teach Access, that, that mission statement of letting people know about accessibility, uh, teaching them about it, why that's so important is, you know, my conversations at Verizon used to be in the beginning of trying to explain what accessibility was and why it's important. Right. It's not just because it's a legal obligation, it's because it's the right thing to do. A lot of my conversations today, they don't, we're not talking about the why, it's more of the how. Um, so you might have new employees coming in and we're training them, but for the most part, people understand why we're doing accessibility and why it's important versus to the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. We got to teach people from the ground up, and I think that's where your mission really comes into play to really help, and that's why I love to support it. And Kate, from your perspective, I guess, you know, you mentioned moving the needle, but I wonder, is it moving a needle or is it banging your head against a brick wall and hoping that brick starts to move at some point? Because, you know, we all know, and I know it in my world of blindness, you know, having the challenge every day of dealing with people who just don't have a clue about disability. You're going into companies where you might think that there is more knowledge, but actually there might not be as much as there needs to be. So, you know, where are, where are you on this? Is it, is it a needle or is it a brick wall? Um, love this question. Uh, it probably depends on who we're talking to, of course. Um, but really where mm. we're spending, of course, as I said, we can do this work without partnerships with um, organizations like Verizon and so many others. Um, but where we spend most of our time is working within higher education. Um, and so what we often find is, you know, there might be faculty who are aware of these topics and are excited to get started. They just don't know what to do. Kind of like Fred to say, I get it, but I don't know what that means for my teaching. Um, that's a different conversation than approaching instructors or faculty who maybe have never heard of these terms before. Um, and so whether it's a needle or a brick wall, you know, we have different approaches to be able to, to engage with those faculty. Um, but, but that's really the goal is meeting faculty where they are and students as well. And what I've seen across the board as we are able to sort of make these entries into these spaces, educational spaces, our students are very eager to know about this. Um, they get really excited to know that this is a field um, that maybe some of them want to have careers in, maybe some of them don't, um, but I really find that a lot of students are driven to do good. Uh, and so there's so many ways that, you know, as, they're, as they become designers, um, developers, et cetera, that they can do good. And this is one of those areas where um, so many of them get excited and think, oh my gosh, I, I can make a difference in what I'm doing no matter what type of job I have. Uh, this question is open to both of you, but Fred, I think from sure. your perspective, as a, uh, from the corporate side, from Verizon's uh, perspective, it can be quite, I mean, you kind of picked up on it there, Kate. You know, there is a fear, I guess, that lives within companies to admit they don't know something. And that can often be the barrier. For, for lots of things, not just around disability or inclusion in that sense. It can, it can affect lots of different areas. Uh, but it seems like Verizon has kind of accepted that fear and said, OK, let's, let's work past that. Let's deal with it. Absolutely. Listen, there's, there's no playbook for accessibility. Let's be honest. I mean, I've been doing this. I've been fortunate. I've been doing this for eight years. But I started from the ground up. Then. Um, and it was from talking to people like yourself, meeting with people, listening, um, bringing in people on my team. Some people have disabilities, some people don't. Mm -hmm. um, and just learning. And I will be the first one to say on a daily basis, ask me anything you like. If I know the answer, I'm gonna give it to you. But here's the best part. If I don't know the answer, I'm gonna be up for and tell you, I don't know. But the good news is I have a whole network of people, whether it's in Verizon, it's partners like Teach Access, you name it, that I can go to to get that answer. And then we can dissect it and understand what's the best way of approaching this. Because there is always a nuance every day. And, that, and that's a good thing. That helps the evolution of yeah. people being excited, wanting to learn more, and they want to solve. 
So here's a question for you. Um, uh, what is the future of inclusive design? How do you answer that question? What do you hope people get out of a panel like that when they leave? For me, I mean, that's such a good question. Of course, it can't be solved in in a single sentence, I would say. But for me, it's, it's really um, being aware of who's at the table. And I mean that as a physical table and the metaphorical table. Um, you know, if, if you're sitting down to design something, um, if you're sitting down or standing uh, to, to start creating a new product, a new service, um, taking a moment to look around and see who's in the room and who's not, um, I think is such a powerful way to start uh, thinking about inclusive design and actually practicing it. Um, you know, if, if you're only surrounded by people that look like you or think like you um, or have similar life experiences to you, you'll end up with a product that is suited for the people in the room. Um, and so when we're, when we're thinking about um, creating inclusive products, uh, who's at the table and who's not? And so I think for me, that's a big piece of it. Of course, it's not that simple that you just put everyone at the table and then magic happens, although that does, that does often happen, but um, there's, more, there's more to it from that point. But um, I just think as we're especially thinking about um, products uh, from the standpoint of accessibility, if we don't have people with disabilities um, and, pe and people who are aware of accessibility uh, at the table, it's, it's always going to then be this afterthought, add-on at the end, whoops, we forgot about it, it's going to be expensive to do this, let's just ship the product anyway. I, I mean, that we won't break that cycle or that sort of, uh, yeah, cycle, I guess we could call it. Yeah. And I'll dovetail off that, if you don't mind, because I think what's important is, I think you said is, is a absolutely 100% on um, point. The other piece of it is knowing the audience that you are working yeah. with. Because, again, people are going to be motivated for different reasons. As long as, at the end of the day, we are caring for accessibility, I will have I will tailor my conversation to that audience as long as I know that I'm going to be inclusive at the end. And so I like to talk to people about, okay, listen, Let's be upfront. Let's look at your design ahead of time. Let's do this in real time so that if we need to tweak it, we can do that together. Kate, Fred, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. You both have a standing invitation to join us anytime you want to talk. This has been a, a great conversation, and it will continue for a long time to come, so we all have jobs. Really appreciate it. Thank yes, you both. Thank you very much. That is Kate Sonka from Teach Access and Fred Moltz from Verizon Wireless from CES 2024. If you want to see the full version of that, we have to cut it down just a little bit. You can head on over to, of course, our YouTube channel as well. We're going to take a quick break and come back with the answers to our question of the day. Stick around. There's more Access Tech Live to come. Get involved and have your say at Access Tech Live on social media. We'll be right back. Access Tech Live will return in less than two minutes. Access Tech Live is in a commercial break. Access Tech Live will return in less than two minutes. Access Tech Live is in a commercial break. The show will return in less than a minute. Tech Live will be back in 30 seconds.
now, back to Access Tech Live, the latest in tech and accessibility with Stephen Scott and Mark Aflalo. And we're back and just time for uh, some of your answers to our question of the day, Mark, and we've been getting quite a response. Yeah, I mean, people are getting super interactive today. I guess it helps when you, you're a live show and people happen to be sitting in front of their computer. It's great. So thank you yeah. for everybody for getting involved. Of course, Kevin in Toronto and Sandeep, who are watching as well. So Billy Kay wrote us and he wrote, AI has already taken my job, but the odd time it uses me for help. Seriously, though, it has saved me hours a week summarizing notes. I love that. I love that answer. That's brilliant. Um, yeah. Doug P23 writes, I use it daily to transcribe voice recordings and make meeting notes. He'll probably yep. enjoy the new Samsung devices, I think. I think uh, mm -hmm. that's one of the things that everybody seems to be doing these days is just transcribing audio and video, which is, which is kind of fun. Uh, Amanda L. writes, I use it to spot check my grammar. It's been a lifesaver. I, I can't oh, I do that, that. Too. I don't do that myself. No, I do that. I do it to check spelling. I do it for all kinds. Yeah, absolutely. I'm with you on that. I just find, you know, at the end of the day, you really have to, if there's anything factual that you're going to go, and I'll give you a really funny example as we kind of close out the show, is uh, my, my my wife plays one of those word games where you have a, it gives you four or five letters and you got to fill in like a, a crossword type thing. So we had to mm. come up with a word that had E in the third position. And we gave it all the letters. We said, give us a word that has E in the third position. And these are the letters to choose from. And it gave me a list of like 17 words. And I promise you, none of them had E in that third position. So the most basic of things you think AI could get right, something technical like that, it can't get right. So do it's, it's not going to help it, you guys. win Wheel of Fortune. No, that's the problem. Yeah, no, right? it's, so it's not. It's, you got it. You can't trust it one hundred percent yet. Sadly. No, yet. I, you know what? I don't think you're ever going to be able to trust it 100%. Uh, Stephen, time. Time's out. Uh, thank you, of course, to, to Kate and Fred from uh, Verizon and Teach Access. Thanks to David Lepofsky, our guest, Aaron Ramirez, of course, our friend in the uh, in, university there. And uh, thank you guys at home for uh, being involved in this week's show. We will catch you next week on Access Tech Live. Thanks for being here. Thanks for tuning in to Access Tech Live. Follow us online on all social media at Access Tech Live. Email us feedback at accesstechlive.com. Hosted by Stephen Scott in Glasgow and Mark Aflalo in Montreal. Written by Stephen Scott and Mark Aflalo. Producer, Mark Aflalo. Live show director, Anastasia Spalding Stenhouse. Technical director, Caitlin Robinson. Audio, Jordan Mulgrave. Live graphics and playback, Kingsley Juco. Graphics coordinator, Eliza Rock. Rocco, integrated described video specialist, M. Williams, supervising producer, Michelle Dudas, produced in collaboration with Aflalo Communications, Inc. and Double Tap Productions. Copyright 2024, Accessible Media, Inc. An AMI original production.